all but forgotten today. The Geneva Bible was the most widely read and influential English Bible of the 16th and 17th century. In fact, it was one of the Bibles that was taken to America on the Mayflower around 1620. It followed the Great Bible of 1539, which was the first authorized Bible for the Church of England. So how did they come about the Geneva Bible in the 1500s? Let's have a look. The Geneva Bible was produced during the time of the House of Tudor, a series of monarchs in England, beginning back here with Henry VII, who was Henry Tudor, and then followed by, as we most of us know, a man called Henry VIII, who had so many wives at the time from 1509 to 1547. He was then followed for a very short time by Edward VI, one of his children, and then for an even shorter period of time by Lady Jane Grey. But the person we want to look at today is Mary I, from 1553 to 1558. Mary I became Queen of England and Ireland until her death in 1558. And her aim was to overturn her, her father's leaning towards Protestantism by bringing back into England the Catholic Church as being the predominant religion or denomination for England at that time. Hence, her name was called Bloody Mary. Her desire to be rid of all the Protestants at that time led to much persecution and even the death and the burning at the stake of many prominent ministers and clergy during that time. Hence her name being called Bloody Mary. And it was because of her persecution that actually caused the Marian exile, which drove roughly 800 English scholars into the European con continent and for a number of them to gather at Geneva in Switzerland. There was a team of scholars led by a gentleman called William Whittingham, as you can see his photo here, assisted by Miles Coverdale, Christopher Goodman, Anthony Gilby, John Knox, and Thomas Sampson. And these men came together to produce the Geneva Bible. It was based upon Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, and also a revision of William Tyndale's New Testament, which appeared back in 1526. The Geneva New Testament was published in 1557, but the complete Bible appeared in 1560. And here is a couple of photos of the front page and also of the Bible itself. So if you just look at this front of this Bible, this is the Holy Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Saint Matthew. And if we just enlarge it a moment, you can see if we can get it large enough over here in chapter two, how old, if you can read that, how old the English was at that time. Um, for example, so saying, where is that king of the Jews? This is born, for we have something or other, he's something or other, I can't pronounce it, in the east, F-C-S-F-T, and have come to worship him. And so it is really old ye English. And uh, it's not something that we could actually pick up and read very easily today. It's almost like a foreign language. But that is what the Bible looked like back at that time, the Geneva Bible. And so between 1560 and 1644, there are at least 144 editions appeared. And for 40 years after the publication of the King James Bible, when King James was in power, the Geneva Bible continued to be the Bible of choice for even for clergy and churches and even during the home. And in fact, Oliver Cromwell, you've probably heard of him, he used extracts from the Geneva Bible for his soldier's pocket Bible, which was issued to the army. The Geneva Bible was unique among many Bibles. It was the first Bible to use chapters and numbered verses and to become the most popular version of its time because of its extensive marginal notes. In fact, these notes, written by Reformation leaders such as John Calvin and others, were intended to explain and interpret the scriptures for the average reader, to help them understand it. The Bible also included things like maps and tables and woodcut illustrations and indexes, etc., not found in anything else at the time. 
So it was pretty progressive Bible for its era. So how does, or how does the Geneva Bible, if we put it into modern English, how does it compare to our trusted King James Version? Let's just have a look at a couple of scriptures. So this is the Geneva Bible verses are from the 1599 edition, and the King James Version are from the 1769 edition, but put into more readable English. For example, if we have Micah chapter 6, verse 8, it says in the Geneva, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what the Lord requireth of thee, surely to do justly, and to love mercy, and to humble thyself, to walk with thy God. The King James Version, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And so there are some subtle differences there between them. In Romans 12, one well-known scripture, Geneva Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye give up your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable serving of God. King James, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So notice in the Geneva one, they have things such as uh, that you that ye give up your bodies rather than that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, um, which is your reasonable service, which is your reasonable serving of God. Just an old format of English. So finally, First John 4, 16, the Geneva says, and we have known and believe the love that God hath in us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. King James Version says, And we have known and believeth the love that God has to us. For God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. And so one of the differences here is that, and believed the love that God hath in us, or has in us, whereas the King James has to us. Both have God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. They just slightly changed some of the words there, but not a not a huge differences. Some of the major differences or the things that brought King, the King James to produce the author are the King James Version, I believe, was the fact that it had so many notes, etc., that came from a Calvinistic uh, viewpoint. Not that uh, King James was not Calvinistic, but it had some theology that he, the ministers and the theologians that were around him at the time didn't agree with, and that's why they tended to move away from the Geneva Bible towards more towards the King James Version. So one final look at some of the scriptures they provide on one of the websites, a download a PDF of the Book of Romans from the Geneva Bible and the footnotes. So let's just have a quick look at that one. Here we have the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Romans, and I'll just zoom in a bit for you. And breaks it down with, for the first verse, he says, he shows, he first showeth on what authority his apostleship stands. From verse 15, then he commends the gospel 16, by which God sets out his power to those that are saved, summoning by faith, etc. And so we have here, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, put apart to preach the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. And so if we look down to the bottom here, we have some footnotes. Like number one, the first part of the epistle containing the most profitable preface under verse 16. Six, number, footnote number two, he move, moving the Romans to give diligent ear unto him, and that he showeth that he cometh not in his own name, but as God's messenger unto the Gentiles and treateth them with them of the weightiest matter that is promised long since by God, by many fit witnesses, and now at length performed indeed. And where are we? Number, for example, if we have a look at uh, verse 3, and we have a look at his son, Jesus Christ, number 2, verse 3, number 2. Uh, this is plain testimony of the person of Christ, that he is but one and of his two natures and their properties. Verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, that obedience might be given unto the faith for his name among all the Gentiles, 
Let's have a look at the word grace. So chapter five, verse five, number two, verse five, number two, this marvelous, liberal and gracious gift, which has given me the least of all the saints to preach, etc. And a cross reference to Ephesians three, verse eight. And so it has, as you can see there, there's a lot of different um, comments about the verses that they put in at that time back in the 1500s. There have been a couple of publishers that have put together the Geneva Bible into more readable English and have been reduced over the last 20 years or so. Um, one of them is the Tole Lege, or I pronounced that word, but there's another one that was put out by a group called Hendrickson's Publication. And this is the particular Bible here that you can see on the screen now, the Geneva Bible, 1560 edition. Um, it's a huge, big Bible. I haven't actually picked it up myself, but it's available in a local Christian bookshop around the world, I believe, at this time. And uh, it's full of all the footnotes, all the uh, the comments, etc., that were in the old original Bible, but in a more readable language. The Geneva Bible, birth, birthed out of the Protestant Reformation, a time of persecution, a time of bloodshed, a time of People crying out to God that they needed a Bible that they could rely upon and that they could read and the local people, ordinary people could read as well. It's a Bible that many people have forgotten about. But I think it is something which we can learn a lot from. Grab yourself a copy, grab yourself a PDF uh, version of it even and have a read of the Geneva Bible. Let us know what you think of it. Do you know about the Geneva Bible? Have you read it? Do you use it in your Bible study? I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe and share so more people may see it. And until next time, God bless.